Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. We're looking at the 10th chapter, and we're looking at verses 24, 25. Remember, we took uh, Hebrews 10, 22 through 25, and I broke it into, I'm actually going to do four lessons, special lessons from it, Hebrews 10. Uh, and they're coming out of three hortatory subjunctives. If you remember, you remember how to identify them? Well, look at verse 22. Let us. That's a key. That's a key that that's a hortatory subjunctive. Look at verse 23. Let us. Verse 24 that goes into 25. Let us. Those are the three. Now, we're down in 2425 today. We've looked at... Uh, We've looked at 22, 23, 24, and 25, but we're looking at tonight. And remember that when I laid that out, and I did it once again, look at the second paragraph, the top of your paper. Notice the bold print, faith, hope, and love. You remember that? That's the triad of new covenant virtues. First Corinthians, we looked at 1 Corinthians 13, 13. We looked at Colossians 1, 4, and 5. Now, what we're, what we're going to do today is verse 24, and then tomorrow night I'll be working on 25. Uh, here's what 24, 25 says. Let us consider that the word consider, now I don't know about your Bible, but I have a study Bible, and so they've underlined uh, draw near, hold fast, and consider uh, to show you that. Um, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds or works, good works. Uh, and we'll talk about that one tomorrow night. Um, because let us consider how to stimulate one another. It's to love and to good works. So there's two connected here in in how to stimulate one another to love and divine production. Then he goes on and says, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching or the, uh, coming near. And tomorrow night, I'll show you something because in verse 25, the and remember that this is all running off from verse 21. Look at verse 21. All these, all these three hortatory conjunctions are working off from verse 21 where Christ is our, our great priest, right? He's our great priest. And we are all priests under him. Every church age believer, because we are in the new covenant, every believer priest, we're in the last days. We're in the days of the, of the coming of Christ. First Advent, and we are all believer priests. And we, and we have looked at that. And so these hortatory uh, subjunctives are laying out the function, not all of it, but the highlights of the importance of our priesthood function, right? Let us do what, see? Let us, do, let us, let us, let us. Well, tonight, he tells us, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and divine production. Good works means divine production. And um, tomorrow night, I'll introduce you to verse 25, where it, 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 it is broken down into three present participles. And that's really important. Now, there's no way I guess you could look at that and know that unless you're just really good in English. But, um, but tomorrow night we're going to look at that because that subject deals with divine production. Well, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll come back and look at our study tonight. How, how, consider how to stimulate 
one another to love. To love, agape. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't, uh, you can't apply it. You can't, lear you can't learn it. You can't live it apart in carnality. And so evidence of carnality in your life is personal sin. And so the issue is to deal with it. And the way you deal with it is 1 John 1, 9, you confess your sin. He is faithful and just to forgive you in cleansing. The cleansing is the work of Christ in verse 7, extended to the Christian life, not for salvation, but for restoration of spirituality. The Holy Spirit is in you. He, he is what produces spiritual life in you. Not only spiritual life, but spiritual activity, production. And so what 1 John 1, 9 does, or the confession of your sin, mental attitude, sin, sins, the tongue of verse sins, it puts you back into fellowship with the Holy Spirit, which is part of the uh, Trinity or the Godhead. Puts you back into the operation where all three members of the Godhead are able to work dynamically in your life. So that's why this is important. Tonight we're in the dynamics of the priesthood function of, of studying and learning. If, if, you know, you learn to live the word of God. You learn it to live it. So I give you a moment of silence to take care of your priesthood business, which is confession of sin, if necessary. Otherwise, go in and pray to the Father about what's on your plate tonight, and that is Bible study. God would teach you something. There would be a learning experience so that it would affect your living experience. And so, our Father, we thank you tonight for these who have come our way by the automobile and by the Internet. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth to our life. I pray that those at home would use the same classroom etiquette that we do here, and that is uh, to turn off all the distractions that would distract them during this hour of study so that they might learn the Word of God without distractions. So I pray for that. I pray they would have good discipline in their life to do that. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, um, notice in the one, two, three, four, fifth paragraph down before I say we're going to study three aspects, we're going to examine this third hortatory subjunctive by dividing it in two parts, verse 24 and 25, when he says, let us consider. And, and what we're going to deal tonight with is how to consider uh, consider how to stimulate one another in love and tomorrow night divine production or good works okay and we have already talked in some detail about the subjunctive use and tomorrow night i'll tell you some important things about the participle when you find participles like this there are three points aren't there i mean it's used three times to point out three things and uh, not forsaking encouraging and drawing near all right so here we are tonight we're looking at how to consider, consider, he says, how to stimulate uh, one another uh, in uh, uh, to love, not in love, but to love. OK. Uh, the, the way you look at this to begin with is when God chooses words and then takes them to another dimension. You pay attention to the word he picks. For example, in the Greek language, there are four words for love. Four words for love. And, and he picks out one of the Greek words to exemplify his love. So it's important you pay attention to words he picks. I mean, I don't, sometimes we, I'm not sure we think that hard about the words he picks. But we all know the words we pick to talk to other people are kind of important, aren't they? Uh, First, you pick your words, and then you pick your tone. Because you can have the right words and wrong tone, and that don't go too good either. So, so, you know, we study this kind of stuff. And so for us, this is kind of important. For a guy like me, it's really important. Because each Greek word has a definite, a definite meaning to your life in a different, a different manner. And so we're looking at the word agape. He chooses the word agape. 
God chose the Greek word agape to present to the world. Now, this is important because he had four he could have chose from. He chose the Greek word agape to present to the world his supreme royal love. It's the word he picked. It doesn't mean that there, the others are of less importance, but it means in this regard, he picked a specific Greek word for love to represent to the world his supreme love, which he is going to call the royal law of love. It is supreme, and he introduces it in the Old Testament. He introduces this in the Old Testament. The Hebrews had a different, of course, they had a standard word for it. They didn't have a different word for different love mechanisms. You know, like friendship love and family love and marital love and, and uh, that type of thing. They just use the word love. And then the, the Hebrews, they have to explain it, what they mean. And so that's when you study Hebrew, that's what you have to learn. I mean, sometimes you, you study three chapters to get a sermon. You don't, you can study one verse and stay in a long time in the Greek. It's, it's just the difference in the languages. So, so what you pay attention to when you find that God begins to use Greek words and, and he picks them out because there could be several like this and he picks out a word and he, he like, like the word savior or, or redemption or things, he uses it. Then he refines it to tell you that I'm not talking about uh, business transactions or something when he's using redemption. He brings it out and he identifies a whole different. So one of the things you pay attention to is words that are used that are developed into a certain way. Then you watch, at least for a guy like me, what I look for is how Jesus uses them. Once you discover that, like you might study Paul and you go like, Jesus uses that word a lot. So you pull that out, you look at it, and you go like, well, God's really trying to tell us something with that word, any, right? Like salvation or redemption or whatever it is. So for, for me, the first thing I do is go back to Jesus and look how he used it. See what he was teaching about it, because you know they're going to be on the same page, right? And he might give you, because he's teaching it. He's teaching, Paul is too, but Paul has picked it up apparently from his teaching. And so you're looking, so here's what I did. This is kind of what I do. I, I, went, I went back and took a look at Jesus, uh, how he was teaching this concept of love. And I looked at Matthew. He does a lot of this with Matthew. And so I looked at Matthew 22 because I, did, I, know some, I knew some things going into this. For example, I knew that in the Old Testament, there, there, that there were two supreme laws of God about love that covered the Ten Commandments, Deuteronomy 6, 5 and Leviticus 19, 18. So, uh, so I went back and I took a look at Matthew, and this is on your paper, Matthew 22, uh, starting with verse 34. Uh, when the Pharisees heard that he had put this, the Sadducees to silence, uh, they gathered themselves together, and one of them, a lawyer, that's a lawyer of that, the lawyer of the law, um, asked him a question, testing him. Uh, and now, look, they're digging dirt. They're digging dirt. We're familiar with this. They're digging dirt to, to try to destroy a good man. They're digging dirt to destroy a good man. This is the way the corrupt people work. So in verse 34, at uh, 35, uh, and here's his question. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? What is the great commandment in the law? Okay. He said to them, he gives them Deuteronomy 6, 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is Matthew's account. He says, this is the great foremost commandment. In other words, this is the first commandment, the foremost. This is the first. Great. You want to know the supreme commandment? There it is. 
And listen, the, the Hebrews knew it because this is called the Shema. This was a daily deal. The Shema prayer was a big deal. This is, the, and they, they, they quoted this Deuteronomy 6, 5. They quoted it, I mean, every day. This was, the, it's called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, your God is one. The Shema. And so this, and so he, he tells them, well, here's the first, we all, we all know this, right? I mean, they, I mean, we all know that that's the first. But he's going to say, here's the one you don't know, and you, what you're doing to me proves it. Now, he's not going to say that. I mean, a lot of the answers to questions that people ask, you had to work it out in your life to get the answer. He didn't, he didn't always give you the answer, did he? The rich young ruler, he didn't give the answer. He didn't say, well, your problem is covetousness. He didn't do that, did he? Uh -uh. He gave him an application on life that proved he, he wasn't going to give it up. And if you fail in one point of the law, you failed in the whole law. So, I mean, he does this kind of stuff. Which is, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus' response with Deuteronomy 6, 5. It was Israel's supreme commandment. This was the supreme commandment, the Shema. I mean, it was nobody... I mean, one of the first thing you learn going through the catechism is that. Okay. Jesus called it the first or foremost because it represented agape love directed, listen to me, to the God side. You know, the Ten Commandments, but here they are. Here's the Big Ten. They have a God side and a man side. Here's the God side. Boy, I'll tell you, other than having a pencil... Um, here's the God side, and here's the man side, right? Ten commandments. There's four over here and six over here, right? Well, there is. You exit. <laughs> Exodus 20. Okay? That's the ten. Ten commandments. Deuteronomy 6.5 goes on this side. How do I know it? What's it say? Love the Lord God with all of your heart, soul, and, and mind, right? Love God. Well, everybody, you know, they go like, well, geez, he got that one, right? I mean, nobody can disagree with that one. But then he does something that's really important. Watch what he does. He says the second is like it. He said, yes, here's the first. Covers the... The biggie right here. And he says, but here's the second one that works off the first one. If you don't have the first one, the second one doesn't work. If you really operate off the first one, then you will operate off the second one. The key word in both of them is love, and that word is agape in the Greek language. It is in our text. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, in the Greek Bible, both verse 37 and verse 39 is the word agape, the word love. And so he's told us, Jesus has told us that the word agape, agape, the word for love, is the supreme. It is supreme on the God side. It is supreme on the man side. Because the second one is what? So you're missing this. The second one is what? what? What's your Bible tell you? Look at your Bible. Listen to what it says. The second is like it. The second is like it. Boy, I like that piece of pie. I'll take a second. It doesn't mean another piece of pie of another pie, right? I'll take a second of that. It means I want a second piece of the apple pie with a little bit of ice cream on the top of it, just like I had with the first one. No, I don't want strawberry pie. No, I don't want cake. Otherwise, I'm not interested in anything more, right? Like it. 
Here's the first. The second is like it. What makes it like it is the word love. And you have to have the love of God in you in order to bring it to man. Who brought it to you? See? And it's you, it is the love of God in you now that takes it to man. That's where you get it to the man side. How does it get from over here to over here? See? The second is like it. Okay. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, get the love of God in you. How do you do that? You know how you get it? How do you think you get that? In the new covenant, because I'm a new covenant guy. How do you think you get that? Mm -mm. How do you get this love? How does it get in you so that you can get over here? How does that happen? No? I mean, it's true. I, I want specifics. I don't want generality. It doesn't get me nowhere. Yeah, there you go. All right, roll. open your Bibles to Romans 5.5 because 5, that's very important because we're New Covenant people. So how does this love of God, how does the love of God get in me so I can take it over to man? Do, 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 have you looked it up? Romans 5.5. 5. I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to put make you put your eyes on it. Romans 5, 5? What's it say? Yeah. See? At the point of salvation, God has poured out his, his love by the Holy Spirit in you. At the point of salvation. See, that's the, look at, look, here, here, I want you to make a connection here. It's important we make a connection. Tell me John 3, 16. There you go. When you believe that, and, and listen, for God, so what? Okay, you're in Romans 5, 5, 5, look at, look at verse 8, look at verse 8, Romans 5, 8, look at 5, 8. God, listen, here's what God says, here's what God tells us, I love you, I have, here's my proof, I have sent my son to die on a cross for you to be buried and raised from the dead on the third day. And when you believe that, you move from perishing to eternal life as a grace gift. You don't earn it, you don't deserve it, but you get it. Agreed? Now listen, here's what Romans 5, 8 says. God demonstrated his love right here. Christ dies on a cross, buried, and raised from the dead. That's how God demonstrated his love, right? God demonstrated his love. See, that's Romans 5, 8. God, how did God demonstrate? See, that's what he says in John 3, 16. This is how I'm going to demonstrate it. Well, in the, in the, so in verse 5, the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, the love that attracted you to Christ, God so loved the world, right? You become a possessor of it. Now, what does Romans 5.5, 5, Pam, read it slowly to us? Um, You're reading from the new, 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 uh, the NAS? NIV. The NIV? Okay. Yeah. All right. To help us not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Right. See, and if you keep reading on, he's going to say, uh, uh, he's going to show you the connection <laughs> Between the love of God. Listen, you don't earn it. You don't deserve it. You don't work to get it. You don't work to keep it. It's given to you as a gift from God at the point of salvation. And listen, this is a way you know that God has demonstrated it, not only to the world, but to you personally. And that connection, that's just a connection between you and God, that he loves you. And how long do you have that love? Forever. Forever. You know why? 
because you have the Holy Spirit forever. John 14, 16. How, how, is the Holy, how, how does this love get in my life? At the point of salvation, the Holy Spirit puts it there. Puts the love of God in my heart. He connects God's love for me to me. Do you see that? The love for me out here has now become the love to me. You can never lose it. Not only that, but you become his child. You become a child. He becomes your daddy, right? That love relation is established. And it's established by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Agreed? Now watch this. So I'm connected. If this works in my life through the gospel of Jesus Christ, then there is that love that I have for man. Because what is, how does he describe this? Love your neighbor as yourself. Th that takes the man side of that. And when you do, then you don't, you don't violate any of that stuff. Because love is supreme. Love conquers all. Love is perfect. Not only in the way it came to you, but the way it leads you to someone else. How to stimulate one another in love. We're not talking human. We're not talking human love. We're not talking family love. We're not talking husband and wife love. We're not talking erotic love. We're t listen, we're talking about God's love. The listen, and I promise you, the world is starved to death for God's love. They'd like to me meet somebody that knows it. And so, and so, here's what Jesus says. I'm back, I'm back to Matthew now. The second is what? The second is what? The first commandment. Here's the first commandment. What's the second? The second is? Like it. <laughs> I want that second piece of pie. I don't want cake. I want the apple pie. Come on. It's like it. Right? And what it is, what is the like it, is the love deal. The love deal. And, and there's nothing like it. There is nothing like it. And we're the messengers of it. We in our priesthood are told to stimulate, to stimulate one another to agape love. In other words, let's just practice in the church. Then we'll take it to the world. Let's practice in the church and we'll take it to the world. Let's practice it in the church and we'll take it to the world. Wouldn't that be good? Wouldn't that be good? Because the world is starved to death for love. They sell Cokes by it. They sell automobiles. They, they, they sell porn by it. Everything is about love. Because they know the world is starved to death for it. And you and I both know it because I was. And you know what this love is? This is absolute. Absolute. Only, God does only things that are absolute. This is absolute love. It's not based on relativity. It's unconditional, it's supreme, it's royal. Now, you know, over here, you know how it, you, the whole, this, this is how we got it in the Holy Spirit. Now we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, right? And we have the fruit of the Spirit, which operates by grace. By the power of God, the Holy Spirit, it operates, and not by human effort or energy. Come on now. And in Galatians 5, 22, 23, when the fruit is explained, the first one is what? Love. And guess what, guess what Greek word that is? Agape. So I can produce it in my life in the power, by the power of the Holy Spirit, whether I like it or don't like it, whether I want to or not want to, because God says it's time to give them love. I give them love. It's unconditional. It's supreme. And when they get it, they know they've got something really unusual and great. Oh, tell me. I mean, any, anybody can pat them on the back and coach them down the street. It's when everything is crunched down and everything. Listen, 
It's when a guy chops your head off and you say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Not hard to love people that love you. It's hard to love people who hate you. Jesus, when he introduces this to the world, he says, oh, yeah, you say lo lo love your brother. I say love your enemy. They went boo, boo, boo. That went over. <laughs> love your enemy. He said, no, this is the love I'm talking about. I'm telling you, this is the one that conquers rather than adultery, murder, stealing, all that, false witness. This is what conquers it. This is, this is what conquers it. You know what our task is? As Listen, there's not one person in here, if you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, as well as uh, on the Internet, if you believe the gospel that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, you believe that for the source of your salvation, you have that love. And you have that love. God gave you that love so that you would understand how much he cares for you so that you could stimulate one another in the church to take it to the world. The world's starving for it. People in the church are starved for it. They'd like to have a little bit of this unconditional love in their life. They'd like, they'd like to see that. And you know where they see it? In the worst conditions, and you offer it to them. Because everybody thinks there's a gimmick. You put your hand on my shoulder to take my billfold. You put your arm around me to steal my billfold. Well, I just hand the back there. there you go. Not everybody does that. Well, a wife should tell a husband that. <laughs> so Jesus elevated Leviticus 19.18 to the second supreme commandment. He presented agape love to the man side of the Ten Commandments. That's what he did. Look at, on these two commandments, look at verse 40. I'm back in Matthew 22. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Oh, the whole law and the prophets. Now, you know what that means? It means that the whole law, what's the law do? It condemns you. It shows you that you have a need to be saved apart from yourself, apart from the world. And the only way that can be done is through, the, is through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father except through me. That would be one example. Right? So he says, on these two commandments depend the whole law. Here is the whole law. Watch this. Watch what he's trying to say. Here is the whole law. This condemns man and, and points him to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The prophets, plural, they tell you the story, uh, they tell you the story of the gospel. The, the son of, the suffering servant, the suffering servant of God will come and he'll be crucified. He will go to Israel. He told his disciples this. He said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. They're going to arrest me and charge me with the most horrible crimes you could ever imagine. Uh, they're, they're going to, uh, they're going to be beat me. They're going to ridicule me. They're going to mock me. They're, they're going to treat me in the worst possible ways. Then they're going to crucify me. But here's the good news. On the third day, I'm going to be raised from the dead. I mean, your life can never get that tough. <laughs> and when it does, it'll be the brightest day of your life, according to Stephen and Paul, Jesus, because God will never leave you nor forsake you. The only person he ever did that to was his son, and he'll never do it to you. Because that was the price to bring you into the family. On these two on these two hang or depend the whole law and the prophets. <laughs> Jeez. I mean, so for me, I pay attention to this. How did he use it? How did he use it? And how did he use it in explaining it 
to the world of religion, which was the world of unsaved at that time. He represented, when he is teaching his disciples this, he's representing the new covenant superiority over the old covenant. For example, in Hebrews 8.13, in the NIV it says, by calling this covenant new, he's made the first obsolete, and what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. And he's talking about, in context, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, which was the prophetic, the prophets talking about the coming of Christ and bringing in a new covenant, right? It is where you, you read about the new covenant. Here's point number two. The application of God's love in the Christian way of life brings fulfillment to the whole law and the prophets. Now think about that. The application of God's love, right? Not just to yourself, but out, out of you, right? Application of the, of the love. Stimulate one another to love, right? Bring, listen, brings fulfillment to the whole law and the prophet. Listen to this. Romans 13, 8. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. Guess what word that word? Love is agape, right? For he who loves his neighbor, Leviticus 19:18 has fulfilled the law. How about that? Didn't Jesus tell him that? He did. Here's one, Galatians 5.14. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, it, and it's found in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Guess what that one word is? Agape, right? Agape love. How about that? During the Last Supper with his disciples before the crucifixion, Jesus introduced this idea to his disciples once again under the new commandment. A new commandment. And apparently nobody took out their pencil and wrote it down. Maybe John, because he remarked about it. A new covenant, a new commandment I give you. Say a commandment or a covenant. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Watch this. Even as. You see the word even as? Circle that. Even as. You're not asking us to do something extraordinary that he doesn't perform extraordinarily for us, is he? Listen, I want you to love one another even as I have loved you. Now we got three members of the Godhead involved in this love. God the Father that set it up, God the Holy Spirit that produces it, and God the Son who's given it to us, right? All three members are involved in this love. That's, how, that's a big deal. Anytime you find the three of them involved in it, it's a big deal. We've learned that, haven't we? You pay attention when the whole, all three members of Godhead show up. That's going to be a big meeting that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Look at, look at, you always look for, you always look for benchmarks. You always look for rep repetition of something. You know what it is? Love one another. Listen to this, that you love one another even as I've loved you, that you also love one another. By this, by, by, by what this, Johnny? By this, what, what, what does he mean by this? Not just love. What did he tell you? You got to love one another. By this, love one another. By this, all men will know. All men, all men will know. Listen, and he's talking about people standing outside of this, the, this group that's loving one another unconditionally, supremely, without, without, Without needing anything back, well, I will do. Well, you think you all I do is love, and I get nothing back. I get nothing back. I get nothing back. How long am I going to do that? Because I get nothing back. I get nothing back. Jeez, that's not the love I'm talking about. That is not the love I'm talking about. That is not agape love. I am not talking about that love. 
That's not the love I'm talking about. And that's not the love Jesus was talking about, and that's not the love the Holy Spirit put in you, and that's, you understand? I don't, want, I don't want to start preaching here. Okay? By this, all men, you know what that means? Listen, they watch us like a hawk. As soon as you declare yourself, then everybody got, oh, yeah, you, you're a Christian. I suppose you're one of those, aren't you? You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do this. You can't. I suppose you're one of them. Well, don't fall into that trap and say, well, I could do them if I wanted to. They don't fall into that trap. Listen, don't fall into that trap. Give them love. Don't go, well, come on, let's go have a beer or something. Don't do that. Don't do that. Sure, you have liberty. This is not time for liberty. This is time for what? There are L words, but this is time for love. And they can find anybody to drink a beer with them. Who's going to sit down and love them, have prayer with them, talk the word of God to them, and try to encourage them to get out of the pit they're in? Right? I'm going to love you. I'm not going to give you a word, and then if you don't do what I say, I'm not going to be back. That's not this love. Well, I tell them, I tell them, I tell them, I tell them. And yeah, listen, so I'm through with it. I love it. The love has got to be a two-way street. He didn't say it there. You're talking in different terms. I understand what you're saying. This is not what we're talking about. This is not the love. And if you will stop that, if it goes, it comes. If it comes, it goes. If you will stop that foolishness and put this love in, in, in application of your life, you will find it has a powerful effect on other people's life. But maybe you don't know that because it's not had a powerful effect in your life to start with because you've not let the love that's been put in there have its full weight in your life. You sit and judge yourself way too much. You criticize yourself way too much. And God's accepted you just way, where you were. In your worst day, he still brought you in. You need to start thinking about the love that God loved you when he brought you into his family and didn't say, you got to change this, you got to change that, you got to be this, you got to be that. Otherwise, you can't come in. And if you slip and fall, you're out. I want you to, hey, that's not God. This is not the love I'm talking about tonight. This love is supreme to all that foolishness. I guess, you know, I've been talking to some people. By this, all men will know. How about that? You don't have to toot your horn. Did you see me just love? Toot your own horn. Listen, God will toot it. And all men will know that you are disciples of Jesus Christ, that you bought into the love idea. Stimulate, consider, that's my message, consider how to stimulate one another to love. That's my marriage counseling. People come to me, well, <laughs> I'm going to quit. Let me share a concept of love that you have no idea about. Oh, I've heard agape. Yeah, right. Talking about hearing it. I'm talking about applying it. I need love, man, love. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples if it's a third-class condition that's volitional. If you have love for one another, but you see it's conditional. If you have love for one another, not it's not hard to love somebody that's easy to get along with, that's a, uh, just a lovable little guy. That's not hard. Yeah, you can find a dog to do that. Jeez. You don't feed him, he'll leave home. You know that? You want to run a dog off, just don't feed him. Unless he's honorable, then he'll stay and starve to death at your feet, right? If he's honorable. Uh, well, I've never had a dog to stay, so I don't know. My dog got killed. Remember that the writer of Hebrews is calling all new covenant priests, which everybody is if they're, if they're saved, to stimulate one another to the standard of God's agape love. See, there's a standard, isn't there? 
if, if you've learned nothing else from me tonight and the standard is based on grace, would you agree with that? Have I made that clear? It's not based on effort and all that. It's based on grace. It's not based on works. It's based on grace. It was given to you as a gift in your salvation. The Holy Spirit was given as a gift, and they then themselves can produce this in you. You can't produce this stuff in the flesh. You can't produce this in the flesh. Maybe once in a million. Maybe once in a million, but I don't, I don't think it'd be that high. Three, God's agape love functions under the new covenant grace operating assets. Now, you may not be familiar with that term. I know some of you are. Grace operating assets. See, one of the grace operating assets, the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit pours out the love of God into your heart and then takes up residence in it and continues producing it supernaturally in your life. Agreed? That's a grace operating asset. Your salvation, it begins at salvation. That's a grace operating asset. It continues to operate on the basis of grace. There are many of them. I'm just going to talk about two. Two grace operating assets that are essential to the new covenant priests stimulating one another to love. Here's my first one. And then I got one or two and then we'll wrap this up. First, is the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Now, he takes up residence in your body, inside your body at the point of salvation, can never leave. John 14, 16, can never leave. And he enters at the point of salvation, Galatians 3, 2. And he turns your body that was a carnal into a spiritual house. Your body becomes the naos, the temple of God. And your body from that day forward is no longer your own. It's been purchased for God by the blood of Christ. I'll tell you, it'd be amazing to me if we could get that one down. First is the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit regarding agape love. I just gave you some of those verses. We are commanded in Galatians 5.16, we are commanded to consistently walk by means of the indwelling Holy Spirit. In verses 22 and 23, we're told that he produces fruit. Singular. Produces fruit. That's one tree that produces nine different kinds of fruit. Makes that kind of unique and different, doesn't it? One tree producing nine. And what is that tree? The Holy Spirit produces that fruit. James 1, 14, 15. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you a secret. Because in Galatians 5, 16, and 17, if you walk in the Spirit, listen to what the promise is. You will not. Say, you will not. You will not fulfill the desires, the lust of the flesh. If you do what? Walk in the Spirit. So here's what has to happen. You have to stop walking in the Holy Spirit. You have to be persuaded to stop walking in the Spirit and walk in the flesh for gratification of your lust. James 1, 14 and 15 tells you that. He says, you're attempted, you're lured, you're baited, and you're trapped. It produces, right? Per that's where personal sin comes from. So here, I'm going to tell you something. This is really important in your life. I'm going to tell you this. I, t I talked to a pastor about this who says, I seem to have a problem with this. And I said, well, I'm going to tell you how to beat it. It's called the inner dialogue. We all have it. You talk to yourself all the time. That's inner dialogue. And you know when you start feeling your flesh, right? We say it different ways. I'm getting angry. I'm, I'm, I'm jealous. I'm emotional. I'm this, right? Come on. There is nothing. Everything passes through inner dialogue. Come on. I mean, it's going on in your head right now. All right, inner dialogue is forever. I mean, and it's not, it's not bad. It's what you do with it, inner dialogue. So you can feel, you, can, you, you have a sense, especially if you've walked in the spirit a little bit, you got a sense about when you're about to get in the flesh. You're being tempted. 
that inner dialogue, let me tell you what you got to do. Let me tell you. Because once that, once that thing starts, it's hard to shut it down. So here's how you shut it down. You go to the Lord immediately. Go to the Lord Jesus Christ immediately. Go to him. Don't try to go to no Bible verse or something at this point. You go to the Lord Jesus Christ immediately and, 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 and present a prayer. You go to him immediately because you need, listen, he's all about spirituality in your life. He's the one that brought it to your life through salvation, set up the whole system in you. So the first person you stop, you stop talking to yourself and start talking to him. Listen, then the second thing is, second thing is that you got to start walking in the spirit. Now, now you're, you're okay because this is temptation, but you've got to up your game right now. You go to Lord, you say, look, I am getting mad. I am really getting bent out of shape. I don't like the way this person is treating me. I, 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 you, you understand what I'm talking about? When that thing starts, immediately go to the Lord right then. Don't wait a day. Don't wait an hour. Don't let it build up until you got a case to go to the federal court with. Do it right away. As soon as you find that dinner, inner dialogue, connect to yourself and, oh, woe is me. Get to the Lord because it's not about you. This ain't about you. This is about how to win over the you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't wait a day to get back. Listen, catch it quick. Catch it quick. The speed of getting to Christ and back into the mindset. Listen, when you go to Christ, here's what happens. Your mind goes, you set your mind on things above and not things on earth, right? Colossians 3, sit, you set your mind. And so for me, what I've learned is just go there. I don't care. I run like crazy. And I go right to the Lord. I do it as quickly as it, when it knocks on my door, I knock on his. Because I know I've got to set my minds on things above and not things below because my mind was about to get set on things below. I've been there and done that, right? Been there and done that. I'm not doing that anymore. I don't have to because I got a supernatural strength of power in the Holy Spirit to overcome if I will walk in the spirit, I will what? I will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. I will not. But you see, it's volitional. Flesh or lust? lust. Lust of the flesh. Yeah. Lust of the flesh. So let me tell you, that's a key to this thing. That's a real key. And the, 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 the speed in doing that is the key. The speed of being able to do that. Listen, this is a simple procedure and it's a basic one-on-one -on -one technique, but I'm going to tell you, you really need to do it if you want to be in the winning category. You've got to learn to do this. You've got to learn. When you go set your mind on things above and not things on earth, an amazing thing, it puts you back into a spiritual mindset. And I have the, if I will walk in the spirit, I will not fulfill the desires. I will not, this will not turn out the way it has every other time in my life. I can, this can stop right here and right now and hold it. And listen, when that happens, then here's what you're going to find. The Holy Spirit knows your situation, knows your need and the other person's need. And here's what he's going to do. He's going to start producing the fruit necessary for you to stabilize your life and the fruit necessary to touch the other person's life. And one of the fruit that's going to touch the other person's life, he may give you the fruit of patience, but he's, I guarantee you he's going to touch them with love because this is how you stimulate one another to love. And boy, have, have I just laid one on you. This is a biggie. This is, how, this is how you do it right here. This is how you do it, people. I'm telling you, this is how you do it. And if you fail in it, if you fail to do that, and sometimes you will, it's a process you have to learn. You gotta, it's got to become habitual with you. It's got to be second nature to you. Then you first jump when I get back quick, right? But you got to learn. You got to learn this inner dialogue. You've got to learn that you are your worst enemy. You are your worst enemy. And, and you don't have to be. You don't have to be. The other one, watch this now, and I got to close down. The second one, the first one is walking in the power of the Spirit. The second one is walking by faith in the faith cycle. And this is where categorical doctrine becomes 
a really big issue. So what I did is I put the face cycle on your paper. You know, you go clockwise, hearing to believing to applying to completing, right? Now, look, that circle goes kind of that way. You know, you got hearing, believing, like that. Draw a line through it like that. Because what you have is you have personal love and you have impersonal love, and this is how they work in the faith cycle. In other words, you study the Bible, you learn what God has for your life, you, you hear it, you believe it, and what it, what it produces with you is personal love with God. This is where the love affair with you and God goes on in your spiritual growth. You're a baby, then you're an immature believer, then you're a mature believer, then you're a super grace person. And God, this is where all of that transpires is on that side. Where he wants to stimulate you, Paul, uh, the writer of uh, Hebrews says, I want, you to, I want you to consider to stimulate one another love. This is where this takes place. That's impersonal love. And that's the man side. Here's the God side of it to you, and here's the man side of it. That's as far as I can get tonight. Tomorrow night, we're going to take this subject back up on divine production. Divine good. Because he put it in the same, he put it in the same category. S consider how to stimulate one another to love, and then he come back and said, and to produce divine good. So we're going to talk about that tomorrow night. Uh, let, me, let me close in a word of prayer, and then we'll do our prayer time. For those with us tonight, both by automobile and the assembly hour, as well as those who have assembled with us across the the world tonight and across the United States to assemble with us on our Tuesday and Wednesday Bible study that we're in. We thank you for coming and pray that this is not just another Bible study in your life. This is a life-changing Bible study. This could be a life-changing Bible study. This was the kind of stuff that Jesus was trying to prepare his disciples. This is what we're trying to prepare you for, especially the Church of America that we have contact with. And uh, this is the, the message of Christ to all new covenant priests across the world. So, our Father, we thank you tonight for these who have dropped in with us to study with us. And I pray, Father, they would understand the life-changing message that God has brought to their hearts tonight through this study. Let us consider how to stimulate one another, one another to love. Supernatural, not natural, supernatural. Can't be produced in the flesh. Whether the person is unbeliever or believer, can't be produced in the flesh. It's produced by the Holy Spirit of God. Pray tonight, Father, that we would get the message and take it to the world. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.